Section 6 of The New Life, La Vita Nuova. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary J. The New Life, La Vita Nuova, by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Section 6. When this song was a little gone abroad, a certain one of my friends, hearing the same, was pleased to question me that I should tell him what thing love is. It may be, conceiving from the words thus heard, a hope of me beyond my desert. Wherefore I, thinking that after such discourse it were well to say somewhat of the nature of love, and also in accordance with my friend's desire, proposed to myself to write certain words in the which I should treat of this argument. And the sonnet that I then made is this. Love and the gentle heart are one same thing, even as the wise man in his ditty saith, each of itself would be such life and death as rational soul bereft of reasoning. Tis nature makes them when she loves. A king love is, whose palace where he sojourneth is called the heart. There he draws quiet breath, at first with brief or longer slumbering. Then beauty seen in virtuous womankind will make the eyes desire, and through the heart send the desiring of the eyes again, where often it abides so long enshrined that love at length out of his sleep will start and women feel the same for worthy men. This sonnet is divided into two parts. In the first, I speak of him according to his power. In the second, I speak of him according as his power translates itself into act. The second part begins here, then beauty seen. The first is divided into two. In the first, I say in what subject this power exists. In the second, I say how this subject and this power are produced together, and how the one regards the other, as form does matter. The second begins here, tis nature. Afterwards, when I say, then beauty seen in virtuous womankind, I say how this power translates itself into act. First, how it so translates itself in a man, then how it so translates itself in a woman. Here, and women feel. Having treated of love in the foregoing, it appeared to me that I should also say something in praise of my lady, wherein it might be set forth how love manifested itself when produced by her, and how not only she could awaken it where it slept, but where it was not she could marvellously create it. To which end I wrote another sonnet, and it is this. My lady carries love within her eyes. All that she looks on is made pleasanter. Upon her path men turn to gaze at her. He whom she greeteth feels his heart to rise, and droops his troubled visage full of sighs, and of his evil heart is then aware. Hate loves, and pride becomes a worshipper. O women, help to praise her in some wise. Humbleness, and the hope that hopeth well, by speech of hers into the mind are brought, and who beholds is blessed often whiles. The look she hath when she a little smiles cannot be said nor holden in the thought. Tis such a new and gracious miracle. This sonnet has three sections. In the first, I say how this lady brings this power into action by these most noble features, her eyes. And in the third, I say this same as to that most noble feature, her mouth. And between these two sections is a little section which asks, as it were, help for the previous section and the subsequent, and it begins here, a woman help. The third begins here, humbleness. The first is divided into three, for in the first I say how she with power makes noble that which she looks upon, and this is as much as to say that she brings love and power thither where he is not. In the second I say how she brings love and act into the hearts of all those whom she sees. In the third, I tell what she afterwards with virtue operates upon their hearts. The second begins upon her path. The third, he whom she greeteth. Then when I say, O women, help, I intimate to whom it is my intention to speak, calling on women to help me to honor her. Then when I say, humbleness, I say that same which is said in the first part regarding two acts of her mouth, one whereof is her most sweet speech, and the other her marvelous smile. Only, I say not of this last how it operates upon the hearts of others, because memory cannot retain this smile, nor its operation. Not many days after this, it being the will of the Most High God, who also from himself put not away death, the father of wondrous Beatrice, going out of this life, passed certainly into glory. Thereby it happened, as of very sooth it might not be otherwise, that this lady was made full of the bitterness of grief seeing that such a parting is very grievous unto those friends who are left, and that no other friendship is like to that between a good parent and a good child, and furthermore considering that this lady was good in the supreme degree, and her father, as by many it hath been truly averred, of exceeding goodness. 
and because it is the usage of that city that men meet with men in such a grief, and women with women, certain ladies of her companionship gathered themselves unto Beatrice, where she kept alone in her weeping. And, as they passed in and out, I could hear them speak concerning her, how she wept. At length two of them went by me, who said, Certainly she grieveth in such sort that one might die for pity, beholding her. Then, feeling the tears upon my face, I put up my hands to hide them, and, had it not been that I hoped to hear more concerning her, seeing that where I sat her friends passed continually in and out, I should assuredly have gone thence to be alone, when I felt the tears come. But as I still sat in that place, certain ladies again passed near me, who were saying among themselves, Which of us shall be joyful any more, who have listened to this lady in her piteous sorrow? And there were others who said as they went by me, He that sitteth here could not weep more, if he had beheld her as we have beheld her. And again, He is so altered that he seemeth not as himself, and still, as the ladies passed to and fro, I could hear them speak after this fashion of her and of me. Wherefore afterwards, having considered and perceiving that there was herein matter for poesy, I resolved that I would write certain rhymes, and the which should be contained all that those ladies had said. And because I would willingly have spoken to them if it had not been for discreetness, I made in my rhymes as though I had spoken, and they had answered me. And thereof I wrote two sonnets, in the first of which I addressed them as I would fain have done, and in the second related their answer, using the speech that I had heard from them, as though it had been spoken unto myself. And the sonnets are these. 1. You that thus wear a modest countenance, with lids weighed down by the heart's heaviness, whence come you, that among you every face appears the same for its pale troubled glance? Have you beheld my lady's face, perchance, bowed with the grief that love makes full of grace? Say now, this thing is thus, as my heart says, marking your grave and sorrowful advance, and if indeed you come from where she sighs and mourns, may it please you, for his heart's relief, to tell how it fares with her unto him, who knows that you have wept, seeing your eyes, and is so grieved with looking on your grief, that his heart trembles and his sight grows dim. This sonnet is divided into two parts. In the first I call and ask these ladies whether they come from her, telling them that I think they do, because they return the nobler. In the second, I pray them to tell me of her, and the second begins here, and if indeed. 2. Canst thou indeed be he that still would sing of our dear lady unto none but us? For though thy voice confirms that it is thus, thy visage might another witness bring. And wherefore is thy grief so sore a thing, that grieving thou makest others dolorous? Hast thou too seen her weep, that thou, from us, canst not conceal thine inward sorrowing? Nay, Leave our woe to us, let us alone. T'were sin if one should strive to soothe our woe, For in her weeping we have heard her speak. Also her looks so full of her heart's moan, That they who should behold her, looking so, Must fall a-swoon, feeling all life grow weak. This sonnet has four parts, As the ladies in whose person I reply Had four forms of answer. And, because these are sufficiently shown above, I stay not to explain the purport of the parts, And therefore I only discriminate them. The second begins here, and wherefore is thy grief? The third here, nay, leave our woe. The fourth, also her look. End of section 6